So good evening. Uh, my name is Megan Whitco. I'm one of our uh, curatorial associates here at DIA. Yeah. And uh, proud to welcome everybody to the uh, Readings in Contemporary Poetry Series tonight. Uh, curated by Vincent Katz, our Readings in Contemporary Poetry. It was reinstated in 2011 and we take the opportunity to highlight commonalities amongst poets, whether aesthetic commonalities or personal connections. And it's my great pleasure this evening to welcome our two poets, uh, Ron Paget and Thomas Devaney. And uh, thank you both for generously accepting our invitation and Vincent's invitation to be a part of the series tonight. And I also wanted to thank the uh, New York City Department of Cultural Affairs. Generous support uh, helps make our programs possible. Um, and we also want to give a little shout out to the Brooklyn Brewery for providing the cold beverages tonight and also to the staff at DIA uh, for helping run and make our programs go smoothly. Um, so just a little bit about the format. Um, Vincent's going to come out and introduce our first reader. And then following that, we'll have a short, um, after the reading, we'll have a short intermission in the middle. Um, if anybody wants to purchase a book or get another beer, they're more than welcome uh, to do that. And after uh, the intermission, we'll resume with our second reader for the evening. So without further ado, I'm proud to introduce Vincent, who will be announcing the first reader. Thank you, Megan, and thank you all for coming. I'm really excited about tonight's reading by Ron Paget and Thomas Devaney. This is, um, there's one more reading this season, which is on December 16th. It's Robert Kelly and Anna Moscovakis, so please come back for that one. And we have just um, finalized our spring 2014 series, which is also going to be great. We've got um, kicking it off with Bruce Andrews and Nada Gordon, then Louis Warsh and John Coletti, David Trinidad and Joanna Furman, and the last reading of the season will be Charles Burkus and Ariana Reigns. So as, as Megan said, Thomas Devaney will read first, then we'll have a short break, and then Ron Padgett will read. Thomas Devaney was born in 1969 in Philadelphia. He earned his BA in English Literature at Temple University in 1993, and his MFA in Poetry at Brooklyn College in 1998. He's a poet, teacher, and editor. His books include two poetry collections, The American Pragmatist Fell in Love, and a series of small boxes as well as the nonfiction book, Letters to Ernesto Neto. He's also the author of the brand new collaborative book, The Picture That Remains, published by the Prince Center of Philadelphia. Devaney is the editor of On and On Screen, an e-journal featuring poems and videos. He teaches at Haverford College and lives in Philadelphia. Thomas Devaney could be a lyric poet, but he is more of an attack poet. He attacks the moment, which puts him squarely in the tradition of Williams and Frank O'Hara. He's indebted to the visual arts, as those poets were, and projects his work into visual realms, most notably by his collaborations with artists. His remarkable new book, The Picture That Remains, pairs Devaney's poems with photographs taken by Will Brown. In this project, Devaney engages entirely with the worlds presented in the photographs, and he speaks from the inherited and imagined authority of, of worlds depicted. Quote, sitting at the counter, looking back out the door, the street's vacancy is demanding, stop, look at your shoes, repair them now. End of quote. I can imagine Thomas Devaney in another time and place as a barker, enticing us to enter the world of his poems by a mixture of wordplay, color evocation, and bravado. Or, to put it another way, Devaney has stage presence, as do his poems. 
His poems are sure of themselves. Early on, Devaney mastered the New York School art of combinatory discovery, quote, you reading Milton and eating a BLT, end of quote, a formalist update of the I do this, I do that approach. He had that brash language, but he composed thoughts in sensitive, unpredictable ways. In his recent work, Devaney's pacing has gotten even ever smoother, though the rough edges of the worlds he observes are as scratchy as ever. Quote, once in a row house garden, there grew a shrub, end of quote, he writes in the last topiary from the picture that remains. Devaney, by his word placement, is able to release the multiplicity of connotations in almost every word in that line while maintaining a surface consistency of natural language. Then, he takes that simplicity into a darker place. He reaches for and achieves depth soundings of places we did not know existed. Please help me welcome Thomas Devaney to do it. It's a pleasure to be here, and it's a pleasure to read with Ron Padgett, one of my favorite poem, poets. I love Ron Padgett. Brought one of his little books with me. Thank you, Vincent. The first poem I'm going to read is called The Blue Stoop. The Blue Stoop. Who remembers the Blue Stoop? I'm laughing at the question, who? Everybody, all the names, like an early book of the Bible. It isn't just the names, they go deep and make three wide steps, three very wide steps and everywhere. There's Franny and Kim, Amy, Gary and George, Dawn Ann and a red-headed brother, brother Bobby, B.A., Matthew, Paula and Rob, Tommy Fliss and all the Flisses, goddamn Steve Fliss, Steve smoking Fliss. Anthony's mother's leaning out the window. Does she ever go out? Yes, every day. She leans out the window all day long. Anthony's uncle played the trumpet. Everyone knows that. But when we say he played the trumpet, we mean he played with everybody. Yes, Tony Bennett. But you've ever heard of Al Martino, Guy Lombardo? People, big bands. He played with them all. And in some third floor heaven, he still is. People say, once upon a time, a call was a dime. They say more than I can, can, that can be said here. They're living. They say, don't forget where you're from, but I don't have to because I never left. Recently, someone said the blue stoop looks smaller than it used to. I guess they know what they're talking about. But don't tell that to Michael, Michael, and Michael, and a generation of roses weaned on a fresh coat of swimming pool paint painted every few years, all the dirty kid faces that will never be clean. Those are my faces. <clears throat> it sounds like there's a, a mm, 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 happening in the middle of that. Put, put it closer to me, okay. This next poem is called First Instrument. A friend texted me and said, I'm gonna start playing the banjo. I wanna learn how to play the banjo. Like, oh, the fuck. So I just texted back, start now. And then I started texting her what to do, even though I don't know. <laughs> First instrument, lesson one, pluck one string, repeat step. Put yourself in the attitude of reception. This is you. Lesson two, save the money for this lesson and continue on one string. How you are sitting, how the string feels on your fingers as much as it sounds. Early on you can go few places, so go where you can for now. When you walk or bike through the city, the string. Address the banjo. That's lesson three. It's bass in your hand. Four. 
neck in the air, five. Think of a tune, start to work it out in your head. If you start to shake slightly, that's okay. The floor may send a chill up your back, adjust. Chart the room as it trembles. The walls are not so flat. Lesson six, seven, eight, nine. Look how differently your banjo woke up today. It's becoming your own. Think about all the lessons up till now. Remember the time you said, I think I'm going to learn the banjo, that spark? Remember the telephone wire and how it shone at night. Even after you closed your eyes, it was there, even now. Review. F <clears throat> Review. Continue to sit with your banjo. Take your time. Sing all you want it to know. The first songs you heard. Yell them. You don't have to say, I hope it likes what I say. The beat is not obvious, so make it obvious. Exaggerate. Add the body. Cancel the count. Your feet, your head. Foot, head, leg, foot. Head, head, foot, foot. Head, head, foot. Tenth lesson, four beats on, four off. Each rest gets perceptibly softer, like you're holding your breath underwater, but now you can breathe there. Time isn't too big of a thing, it's the only thing. Look at the back of your hand, the hair on your hand. What holds the notes together after they've been played? The room, the body of the banjo, your head, fingers, a cloud, two clouds, check temperature. Tone matters. The early songs remain vibrating in the air. It takes time, how time sounds. It's not what you expect and not completely safe, but sound, yes, why we have ears. 11, the sweat of the strings, where everything comes home to roost. Hold up in a niche. Play the tune you've been playing. Fake nothing. Chickens are dumb and fierce, and they can be fooled, yes, but who wants to fool a chicken? This is not a folk song. If you're going to play, play the moment. For now, everything else is there. Sing yourself a question and sing back the answer. It comes through the playing. This is July. That's enough for the month. Lesson 12. Late at night, in late August, the light passes through the room. Domino, domino, dark domino, out in the woodshed, whatever that place is for you. Shrum the open string, hold down a string and shrum, shrum and hum. Listen to the night all night. It's never the same. Watch. Vincent mentioned this book that I did with Will Brown, who's here tonight. And it came out of a project I did with the Philadelphia Museum of Art. They had a show called Seven Philadelphia Photographers from the 60s and 70s. And I wrote a bunch of work surrounding that time. And it just sort of kept going. So I wrote about a lot of artists at that time. One of them I liked a lot is a, a woman named Deborah Hay, who's a dancer. And I wrote this piece called All Day Dance, 1963. All Day Dance, 1963. Implacable in a chair. She sits in the only way she knows how. Completely. Then, much later, a turn or rather a push into the place she looked headed. The sound of a clap hits everyone. A door is open and remains so. And now she's leaning forward and is arched towards the floor. Her legs mark another space. She has moved. The whole body has moved. Shunting the body in this manner is difficult to do, or even think about doing. It is strange that this should not be stranger than it is. The chair you sit in is not made for this, as the day stretches into one hell of a long night. But you let go, or don't hold on. There was someone else too, 
another person is moving more lightly, more quickly, and maybe more wrongly. This is a duet or two solos. You can follow either or neither. He's all over the floor, covering and uncovering more space, revealing more area, though is perhaps but a marker, holder, or something she is dreaming. Perhaps it's he dreaming her, or us, them, or they, us. And now, an hour or more later, her feet have found the floor. She hunches forward and is out of the picture. Her legs are gone, her head gone. Silhouettes, as if this could be an ending. Poem written in an airport. Poem written in an airport. Either you put the paper clip on or the pen will bleed red. Either I look out the window or write the best poem of my life. Either the tape will stick or the leaves will remain until winter. Either the photo will make you cry or you will call an old friend in California. Either the aloe will soothe your skin or you will be back in grade school. Either the song will go on until the night, or you will wake up without music. This next poem is called Runaway Goat Cart. And I saw this little image, it was about this big, of a, a cart with a goat and then two little kids in it. It's a painting by a guy named Bill Trailer, And I think they had some of his work up here um, recently. I kind of just kept thinking about it. I bought the postcard. <laughs> Runaway goat cart. This is how the cart starts. Like a bad brother and sister team hitching up the horror. The goat cart starts like this. A stuttering bobble. The path, low branches, patches of light. The lake through the woods. Something like smoldering fire in the nose. It starts like gumption and bad apples. Those large wheels wheeling larger, cracking forward. To fly and to die, but first to shout in the buggy air. Night of mosquitoes and mud, night of uprooted trees and glee. Swooping bats, nothing left to see. They picked up speed like this. Sister says no, and brother says no, oh no. The blind scratch of a the thicket, one, two, three, four phantoms more. The scent of tree clumps in each divot. This is how the mud matted goat runs. Its slat eyes back behind its head, a fright outstripping her own muscle bands. And those freak eyes again. This is how the goat and cart run off from each other. Vaulted, bloody nose first. The scrappiest kid fighters taking out at the knees and all the body parts rattling right the fuck off. This, how they nearly capsize, cleaving, clawing, pounced by forces beyond their control. Starry, starry stars, starry, starry scars, the last screech inside their nonstop stop. The cart shifts like this, the cart shifts like this. Blue is for night when night is black. Black if they could see and black if they couldn't. There's no keeping up, no way to say no more, no hell, no holy shit, no holy shit hell. If you want a story, come back tomorrow. I was kind of thinking of those kids as kind of feral. And um, putting this in some kind of sequence, I wrote a poem that's kind of like this homage to like just kids growing up in the suburbs that I'm aware of. It's called Burning the Bear Suit. Love's the song, a do-it-yourselfer out on the highway. Cord by cord we stand on the shoulder, shredding the light of day. 
We shred it. Step by step, we kick out of the bear suit we are born in. Lanky and cranky, we say, quote, I'm a bear. You're a bear. I'm a bear. You're a bear, too. Pretend is real enough, and we can't pretend is real enough. We have nothing to give, so you have nothing to get. We beat you to the punch. It's true. We simply don't know how to walk in the woods. When we were younger, we could. We think we did. But now we don't know anything about it. What was that? Our hunger lingers on, no doubt. Just don't mistake it for winning anything. Our taste for butter and babies, butter, our taste for butter babies goes beyond the need for vitamins, mineral, and butter. Now look, now look again. What we say and what we do is pretty damn close. Our sneakers are bruised and our paws are too. Wired and sleepy, babies on board go nuts when they see us. Their eyes bug out and their laughter is insane. Is it art? Burn the bear suit and everyone is there at home and crowding into a massive plaza or lonely garage. The, sh the shabby suit, our scraped heart, a room we rent. There's only one thing to do, one thing, the thing we are doing. So I'm going to read three poems from my book with Will Brown and then I'll end with uh, the last poem. All three of these are in this uh, book that's coming out. There's a mock-up of it out there. It's like at the printers. It's very pretty. Here's like a picture from it. I love it. The picture that remains. Every project I do, you're kind of writing it slightly differently. So all, all the poems are kind of kind of something else, something not me, me, whatever it could be. The picture that remains, buzzing in the glass, the soda water has gone to my head. Sitting at the counter, looking back out the door, the street's vacancy is demanding. Stop, look at your shoes, repair them now. A lot of signage I'm quoting. I continue to look, the green on dark green plywood street, street where the window used to be, someone's be second best suit, a Buick special that clicks, starts, and goes, the shoe man silhouette, a sign itself, the storefront window of the wireworks, the cross old timer will have none of it, of what? The oldest old mean guy who stops by the lunch net every day and says, quote, clear as a comb and in living memory of the James A. Garfield administration. Across the street, the street noises no longer enter the room. The door frame has been stripped down and there's another layer in its place. Worn hash marks, varnished staples, and what good is the silence? It won't even hold up the window pane. Nothing does. It could crack or crash any minute. The front window sill has two cats scrunched into the last patch of sunlight. The largest of the pictures was deinstalled. The crew carried it away. And this is the one that remains. And so this curator at the PMA hired me to write about the show, and uh, Will was one of the people. And then he said, oh yeah, you should get to know Will. He was friends with Rudy Burkhart and uh, Edwin Denby, and these people that I think you've heard of. And so I did get in touch with him, and we started talking. But Will's kind of shy. But we became friends out of that. This is a, a, another poem from the book. It's called Geist. Anchor to the corner hutch, the family called it, quote, the hall tree. Mirror etched from the curtains, inset and set back endlessly, giving. Never not something to look at, but you couldn't see yourself exactly. The dark shelves thinned to a vintage port wine and to innumerable umbrellas that once stood there, leaning. The family cursed to the business of blindness. The console now, a splinter member, a splinter member of both clans, the Hutchgeist, and we its guests. A sack of purple potatoes fueling a clock. Some trickle, some stream in the black walnut stain. It's current, current, three quarts of holes, one quart rainwater. This is the last one from the Will Brown book. It's called The Branching Shadows. The Branching Shadows. 
It was the branching shadows and window that stopped me, not the coming spring fashions, a Japanese poem. But I was far from Japan and not even born. Even translations can have this effect of light and what is dying and what has yet to be born. There was air there, so I stayed for a little while, taking my only advantage, a breath, a will, and a breath. And this is the last one. It's called Darkroom Diaries. And since I was uh, sort of immer immersed in all this material, I just wrote this one big catch-all poem, and I was just thinking about a person, a student, who had to go to the, the, the dark room like every Wednesday night for like a month, you know, a whole semester. So I, I wrote this diary in a voice that I, I had in mind. Dark room diaries. And, and last, I just want to thank Vincent for setting this up. Thanks, Ron, and everybody for coming out. Darkroom Diaries. Diary found in a dark room at Moore Women's College of Art, dated 1972. Tuesday, September 19th. The fresh air will kill you. Tuesday, September 26th. The radio in the next room turned to a classical music station all night. Tuesday, October 2nd. Eskimo headgear in the museum. At Shelley's drugstore, kids rode up on their bikes and handlebars. Tuesday, October 9th, fell asleep on bed while smoking, woke up to smoke everywhere, ran outside with the smoldering Navy comforter. Tuesday, October 16th, a piece of scrap paper found in my pocket, but there's still time to save the lives of your children, written in pencil. Tuesday, my legs are dolphins that cut across the surf. Tuesday, November 2nd, awake again, Sleep, dream, the Andy Williams show, drink. Some people came in wearing trench coats. Tuesday, November 9th. Susan said it's forbidden for our pictures to echo the objects they depict. Nothing looks like that, she said. But it's allowed, it's allowed for the world to look the way it does. Fine words, those. Tuesday, November 16th. One more night, still here. Tuesday, November 23rd, some nights you skip. Tuesday, November 30th, cold Sunday afternoon, grandmother's block, Orange, New Jersey. The smooth slate pavement where I roller skated as a kid are all broken up by the massive roots of the old red oaks. Took many photographs, the many sides of the sidewalk. Tuesday, December 6th, the tunnel leads to probably the deadest area in the city. Sonny Rollins playing St. Thomas. We are not found out. Only Debbie's dog, Trixie, and me dancing the calypso. The rhythm and tune in Trixie's large bright eyes. She's no dummy, only a perfect patchwork of black and white and brown. Take a solo, upright bass, tenor sax, and drums. No, that's not a real solo. That's the bass, hi-hat, and Trixie. St. Trixie herself. Tuesday, December 13th. Prints are not reproductions. Susan said this is a mistaken idea. What you're looking at is a photograph. How something looks there. After class, Laura said, quote, there are many good reasons not to quote Julius Caesar. Th this is all I will say, she said. And then there's just a, you know, a couple undated entries. Glamour, a starlet in an Alp ski town. It doesn't just happen in novels. It doesn't just happen in movies. Quote, it's theater for somebody, somewhere. And it loved to happen in every diary ever read. Like Marcus Aurelius always said, be not too eager. Thanks for the book, Dad. Bodies, thresholds. 200, <laughs> 200, Two to three hundred color snapshots on the bathroom wall. Flawless Sabrina through the door. No saints in three acts, she declares. On your mark, get set, pull back. Jack D's electrical tape facelift. Two more 
two more, more menthols for the tall lady in the living room, the top few buttons of her purple dress open, her hairy chest beautiful. For the past 10 minutes, she's been getting a blowjob. Dee Dee, who took me here to meet Jack, was checking around on the plants. Now he's at the fireplace making and partly burning Jiffy Pop butter, butter popcorn as it erupts through the tin foil. Peter Hujar's reclining portrait of Mae Wilson, a photographic Matisse, the color of the arabesque only richer in silver print, the black and white. I want to live in that world. From the time I was 12, I wanted to marry Van Morrison. What a jerk. Avedon and Baldwin's disturbing and gorgeous nothing personal, the black glossiness of the black borders, that we were all custodians of something more, every face an argument against cultural suicide and suicide itself. Vinegar, mayo, hard-boiled eggs. No thanks. Last one. A picture postcard from Ingrid. Her light sail boat penmanship on the back. Steel Pier Atlantic City in soft watercolors on the front. The watercolors are the colors of water taffies. Someone said they made up all those flavors down there. But it's a lie. A beautiful lie. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's my pleasure to introduce Ron Paget. Pleasure and also a daunting task. Ron is, is um, well, we, we need to write a book to do a, an, an adequate introduction, let's put it that way. But here's the introduction for the reading. Ron Paget was born in 1942 in Tulsa, Oklahoma. He received a BA in English and Comparative Literature from Columbia University in 1964. His poetry books include How to Be Perfect, You Never Know, Great Balls of Fire, and just out his collected poems from Coffee House Press. He has translated Blais Centrard, Guillaume Apollinaire, Pierre Reverdy, and others and he has edited Edwin Demby's poems and Joe Brainerd's writings. He has also published memoirs of Brainerd and of Ted Berrigan. Paget lives in New York City. Ron Paget is a master of minimalism. One of his early poems reads in its entirety, Jet Plane Flies Across Sky. It is not only witty, it is also true and poignant it is a modern urban image, and it carries in it the weight of implication by concision. Another poem from that period is perhaps more self-consciously modernist, a sonnet in which every line is identical and identical to the title, nothing in that drawer, nothing in that drawer. But Paget has also been a master of the long poem from his early days as his 18-page opus, Tone Arm, makes evident. There's often an eye in Paget's poems, but it is often an arch or literary eye, as in his poem, Birches. When I see birches, I think of nothing. But when I see a girl, throw away her hair and brains. I think of birches, and I see them. One could do worse than see birches. And yet, Paget is able to play almost endlessly with the audience's expectations of the narrator in his poems. He has commented that his writing process consists of starting somewhere and then letting his mind take the poem wherever it will. These unpredictabilities are what excite us in a Paget poem. In June 17, 1942, the narrator appears to be Paget. The date is his birth date. He refers to his wife, son, and friends by name. However, the poem, which at first appears to be deadly serious, then seems to be ironic in tone. This shifting back and forth is never resolved entirely, but in my opinion, it is where the poem leaves the reader or listener that counts with Paget. 
He is a master of endings as much as he is of beginnings. In June 17, 1942, he leaves us in the present, and the ultimate impression is serious after all. I would like to propose that Paget, as well as being one of our most hilarious poets, is one of our most serious poets as well. Tonight, we have an opportunity to tune in to the multifarious Ron Paget. Please set your receivers and help me to welcome Ron Paget. Thank you. I have laryngitis. So I won't talk a lot <clears throat> between poems or between pieces. I'm just going to read and see if my uh, word message units last the evening. If not, I'll call on some of you to come up and read them for me. You think I'm kidding. <laughs> Can you hear me though okay? Yes. okay? Thank you. Just everything. This morning, the radio says that scientists are shocked to learn that the universe is expanding faster than they thought. Everything eventually will be frozen. What a funny idea. Everything frozen. Then what? Just everything frozen. Expanded and frozen. <laughs> Martok in autumn, 53 years later. I walk around early fall, no one around. Pick up this limb, that heave them off down the side of a drop, a birch or something, heave them too, into the sound of the stream that cuts through and down the land. And as I do, I feel the trees are looking down as if to wonder, what the heck does he think he's doing? 10 million trees, one me. My 75 Chevy. Out in the yard sits my 1975 Chevy pickup truck, re repainted red with a white roof, dents erased, carburetor rebuilt, new tires, new dashboard, black leather seat covers, new floorboards, and two new side mirrors. In a timeless yard, really a small clearing in a forest. Old timers would call it a dooryard. It creates its own time zone, 1975. It's hard for me to think of driving simultaneously in 1975 and 2013, but I do it because when the truck goes forward, I enter the sliding zone known as miles per hour and I'm just a no one in something red. And now I'm gonna go out on a limb and read a, a, a prose piece that I wrote uh, a couple of months ago uh, up in Vermont. And it's about 15 pages long, and that'd be the last thing that I read, assuming I get to the end of it. <laughs> It's called Completion. I am writing this in a school notebook whose name, printed on the front cover in large type, is Completion. And to make the name even more puzzling, it has a sort of subtitle. Take your fun where you can find it. The notebook is from Japan, which perhaps offers some idea of why this title and subtitle have been joined in such an unlikely place. I am in a place that is neither likely nor unlikely, 
a cabin on a pond in rural Vermont. I have come here to write in this notebook for reasons that are even more mysterious than the notebook's title. I can say with certainty, though, that I am sitting at a small, cheaply made table with fold-down aluminum legs, which an artist friend of mine bought 35 years ago. And if I part the curtains in front of me, I will see the same view as I did around 45 years ago when I sat in this very room writing poetry. Two poems in particular, one called Radio and the other one called Arrive by Pullman. The pond made an appearance in the latter when rain started to fall. It rained earlier this morning as well, but now the sky is just an overcast gray. But weather is not what I had in mind when I thought of coming here to write in this notebook. I was thinking about, um, or rather, I had an impulse to write about aloneness. That word struck me as just right, but odd. Shouldn't one say solitude? No. Solitude is something else. In solitude, you have no one around you. With aloneness, you can have others around you or not. Solitude is usually good. Aloneness is usually not, at least in the way I'm thinking of it. To be honest, my thoughts on this subject are vague. The one thing I do understand clearly is that being an only child has had such an all-encompassing effect on me that I was unable to perceive that effect. All I knew growing up was that I was glad I didn't have to share a room with anyone. My friends and classmates had brothers and sisters who were mostly annoying to hear them tell of it. But as I have grown older, the impact of being an only child has revealed itself more deeply, and what I thought of as a privileged status has begun to look like a deprivation. Fortunately, I have a wife, a son, a daughter-in-law, two grandchildren, and a sister-in-law, as well as a number of friends, some for more than half a century. This takes the edge off my aloneness, the soothing effect of being with people I would give my life for. This deep bonding, well, let's call it that for want of a better word. Um, oh God, I forgot what I was going to say. I do know that I was preparing myself to leap into the image of a man holding his head in his hands, not from fatigue or dismay or grief, but simply as a way of having the physical sensation of encircling his inner self, of locating it in the material world. For I believe, simplistically perhaps, that myself is centered in my head, or at least spends the great majority of its time there. By self, I mean the conscious self, the one you can talk with, the one whose thoughts are in the words you think and are aware of thinking, and even in the semi-conscious self, the one of half-sleep and intuition, of unexpected conceptual jumps, seemingly bizarre associations. It's the self that appears on waking and fades out in sleep. In short, it's the person you have to live with all day. You might like this person, or you might not, which, of course, is very important for your everyday life. But either way, you are stuck with being who you think you are. And though the identity of that person can evolve over time, the fact of its being there does not change until you die. And after that, I have drawn aside the curtains and taken a glance at the pond. Its surface is absolutely still. In fact, everything outside is immobile. Trees, sky, air. The only things moving are my arm, hand, and pen, though from time to time I shift in my chair and take a swig from a small bottle of water. What if I had no wife, no family at all? Such things have happened to people. I'm thinking of the Holocaust and continue to happen. The Middle East or Middle America. Suddenly, they're gone. How do you manage to go on living? Clearly, you could not be your old self anymore. But where do survivors find the strength to endure such violent revisions of reality? I can't imagine being able to. 
I do not have the physical stamina, nor do I have the emotional strength. The strong self as an independent entity capable of not only surviving, but also of taking some pleasure and satisfaction in life. I depend, I depend on those close to me more than they know. Yes, yes, I'm a writer who is convinced that he is a writer, that it matters, and that from time to time, and that the time I devote to it, and not to my family, is justifiable. But when I peel away my identity as a writer, a husband, a father, and so on, right down to the isolated creature that I fundamentally am, I turn away from that creature, unable to look into its sad, bewildered eyes that seem to be asking, ha ha, the eternal questions that arise in a sensitive adolescent. Why am I cursed with consciousness? Am I the result of a freak accident in the universe? Is the universe itself a freak accident? And why do I have a consciousness that presses these questions on me? Why can't I be more like an ant, dutifully shuttling to and fro as part of a society in which the idea of anxiety does not exist? In fact, no idea exists. Surely the universe would go on without ideas in it. In my first year of college, I read a book called The Origins and History of Consciousness by Eric Neumann. As I recall, he offered a psychological interpretation of the story of the Garden of Eden. That is, the expulsion of Adam and Eve symbolized the birth of higher consciousness when humans separated themselves out from animals. Thus, the triumph, however tenuous, of the conscious over the unconscious entailed a loss as well, the loss of innocence, that is, the loss of being an animal unaware of its own mortality, but also the loss of the bond with the other animals of the earth. Humanity had taken the first step toward isolating itself, and it would seem that we have taken many more steps in that direction, to the point that now we are isolating ourselves from one another. The final step would be to isolate ourselves from ourselves, in effect, erasing our humanity. If you want to see that in a positive light, imagine it as a return to the Garden of Eden, except that the garden itself would be gone too. Give a man pen and paper and he will obliterate the Garden of Eden. <laughs> I look out the window. Small ripples on the pond, fog in the treetops. Was it there before? I have the day ahead of me. Things to do, things to think about doing, and whatever else happens to come up. I will be normal. The way a person I am, the way the person I am, I'm sorry, I will be normal. The way the person I am known to be is normal. I'm by no means saying that this is a bad thing. After all, one cannot live entirely in an existential quandary. We need breakfast, too. And in the end, who is to say that breakfast is less important than quandariness, or even that the two aren't fundamentally the same thing in different forms? That is, you do what you do. Aside from a bit of amateur psychology, I've never been able to understand other people. That is, to have a grasp of what drives them. Perhaps no one really does. But what surprised me was how long it took me to realize that my knowledge of other people, even those I call my best friends, was superficial. Perhaps this is one of the reasons I've gotten along with them so well. <laughs> Another reason being our deep affinities, despite our differences. Little did I suspect that when they died, one by one, they took a little part of me with them, just as I kept part of them, or so I believe. Perhaps this is simply a way of making their absence less, um, I was about to say painful, but empty is a better word for it. Outside the window, the pond is only a few feet away, and I can't help but see Joe on it again, as Joe Brainerd. I can't help but see Joe on it again, floating around in the afternoon sun, his eyes closed as he goes into a deeper relaxation, the little flotation mattress under him slowly rotating and drifting. And suddenly they come back. Ann Kepler, Ted, George, my mother and father, my grandparents. And I feel as if it is my fate to represent them, 
which I do automatically, simply by being alive. And so we have the voice in our head, the one we think of as ours, the one we have listened to and even replied to since early childhood, when words became things and not just meaningless sounds. Look, I can pick up that word and move it to over there. And so the dialogue that lasts a lifetime, the dialogue that sustains us no matter how tedious or repetitious it becomes. Can you have a thought that is completely unlike any you've ever had before? I don't think I can. The words for it seem to be locked out of my head where my consciousness is dashing around looking for something it can't find and doesn't even know what it is. The day goes by and late in the evening the mind assumes it has done its best and turns part of itself off for a while, leaving the other part to do whatever it does. I used to put great stock in that other part, the, the dream life, and I, I suppose I still do. But now the paradigm of conscious versus unconscious seems way too simplistic. There's something beyond my concept of my own mind, beyond my sense of myself, but I do not know what it is. A dragonfly hovered over the water's surface for a moment, then sped on, as if with an absolute sense of purpose. The new pine boards in this cabin smell good. If I sit and wait long enough, something will come to me. That's a little like saying that if you stand long enough on a mountaintop during an electrical storm, you will eventually be struck by lightning, and the light bulb above your head will explode. My penchant for comic book imagery comes partly from having immersed myself in comic books as a child, alone in my room, but not really alone, since I was with my friends, Daffy Duck, Little Lulu, Plastic Man, Sad Sack, and a host of others, all of whom lived in a world in which order prevailed and the colors were bright. Most, most other children were unpredictable. Their heat eating habits were strange. Their clothes looked unmatched. Actually, all my friends were boys. Girls were objects of attraction, glowing with vague romantic auras. And aside from my tomboy cousin, I didn't have a girl as a friend until I was in high school. And even she had been an object of attraction. Finally accepting that she was not going to return my full affection, I made a big adjustment that allowed her to be my friend, while all the time trying to figure out who she really was and what she wanted from life and from me. I never succeeded in doing that. And when she died at the age of 23, uh, I still see her as she was. And for a moment, I yearn to go inside her mind. And then I tell myself to stop wanting the impossible. Still, the urge does not go away. The urge to understand my dead friends and to go back and rescue them from the fate that took their lives. Hmm, a classic case of regret, survivor guilt, or something worse. I should know better, and I do, but I don't. Why do I subject myself to such yearning? Why can't I be contented with looking out this window at the inverted reflection of tall pines and spruces quavering on the water? the light blue-gray sky below them. When written down, such a poetic image is at first pleasing, then mainly distracting, which makes me just like it, though I like it out there on the pond, the real pond. Over the past several years, I've been compiling a list of expressions that were common in my childhood, but never or very rarely heard these days. This morning, I remembered another one, Oh, not a particularly good example. Bats in the belfry. As a child, I knew what it meant even before I learned what a belfry was because of the context. It turns out that what I really miss is not the expressions themselves, but the contexts in which I heard them. I miss words like buckager, but what I miss even more is hearing my grandmother say it in the living room in her home with my grandpa tilted back a little in his recliner chair on a Saturday afternoon, 
stockinged feet elevated, and Grandma in the doorway to the adjoining dining room, through which she came from the kitchen to join momentarily in the conversation. With Ernest Tubb, or Bob Wills, on the big brown console radio across the room near the front door. I still listen to the radio, and I still like old-time country music. And sometimes when I pass by a mirror, I catch a fleeting aspect of my grandfather's face. So that in a sense, all these things have not utterly vanished. But I am crazy, or juvenile enough, to want my real grandpa to still be there in his recliner. Everything exactly the same for all eternity. In fact, I want every moment of my life to still be there the same for eternity. Perhaps an unconscious dependency on this yearning has kept me from making a greater effort to understand the people I felt close to. For instance, what did my grandfather think about when he was alone? How did he feel about himself? Men of his time and class left very few records of such things. Even the diaries of rural and working class people, kept I think mostly by women, often are made up of short, objective notations such as, cold and cloudy today, Helen visited. What's that big ripple in the pond? Aha! The brown head of a beaver, cruising around, looking for what? Maybe it's a muskrat. I don't have my distance glasses. I look back up from the page. The head has disappeared. No, now it's back. And I can see more of the body, a length of about 12 to 18 inches along the spine. It seems to be holding something white in its teeth, unless the white is its teeth. <laughs> now another critter comes gliding across the pond, a small duck that goes over to some water lilies and seems to be feeding on something there. Seeing animals like this always strikes me as a privilege, a reaction that rural people would find amusing, the way I stifled a laugh when a working class country friend of mine in his late 70s visiting New York City for the first time and looking down from the top of the Empire State Building at the streets below, kept exclaiming, look at all those yellow taxi cabs. <laughs> Who was it that used to say, I got tired of hearing myself think? There must be people who would say the opposite. I'm very pleased to hear myself think. <laughs> Being unable to get a song out of one's head is aggravating, an extreme version of hearing oneself think in the same way too often. Maybe that's part of my problem. Do you remember when someone would say to another person who was repeating himself or herself, hey, the needle's stuck. If you don't know what a record player was with the needle in the tone arm, then that expression will mean nothing to you. But then you probably use expressions that mean nothing to me. That's the way the world is. However, we can make an effort to understand each other, even though we hardly understand ourselves. It is not given to us to understand everything, being swept along in the flow of life in which a million things are happening in and around us at every moment, and now sunlight falls across this page, as if making a cryptic comment on what I just wrote, like the fly that landed in the words of the poem A la Santé that Apollinaire was writing in jail. A few years later, he was shuddering in the horrendous trenches in Champagne, bullets and artillery shells whizzing and exploding, poison gas drifting toward him, rotting corpses left and right. And here I sit in a little cabin on a placid four-acre pond surrounded by pine trees, sunlight slanting through the window to my right, the only sound that of my pen scribbling away. What right do I have to bemoan my fate? The right that only a spoiled, that a spoiled only child assumes all too easily, virtually as a birthright. I took a peek at an earlier part of this writing when I said, to be honest, my thoughts on the subject are vague. This sounds exactly like something I wrote 57 years ago at the age of 14. Perhaps I should get up from this chair and dust the windowsills or accept the fact that a 14-year-old boy occupies too large a space in my psyche. He desperately wanted to be loved by a girl, a girl he was in love with, but it was not to be. A year or so later, there was another girl, only this time I was not perplexed by her. I was fascinated by what I saw as the impenetrable depths of her soul. Again, my love was unrequited, 
but she did give me her companionship. And she said something that jolted me. Why do you go by the name of Ronnie? You're not a kid anymore. Ron sounds much more mature. From that moment on, I was Ron. <laughs> Years later, I considered using my legal name, Ronald, but it sounded too formal for the person I am. And I'm still not happy that I was named after the film star who went on to become president. <laughs> for a moment just now, I tried to imagine what it was like to be Ronald Reagan, but the vision of it was so disturbing that I stopped. <laughs> I've never wanted to be anyone else. But being satisfied with one's own identity leads easily to a complacency about it. And, and though, by my age, it's better to accept oneself than to reject it, that doesn't mean one should not be open to change. Staying open isn't easy, but it seems like an optimistic thing to do. And optimism is something we'd all use more of. I should be more open to the idea that it is not a tragedy that writing this in this notebook has brought me no closer to discovering what it was I might have been looking for, particularly since there's no way of knowing what it might have been. I came here not to find a pond, but in an odd way I did find one, one that I am happier than ever to be with. I found the new sun, pine smell of the cabin walls. I found quiet, and I found release however temporary, from the urge to understand. Perhaps now I can dust those windowsills without feeling that it's an evasion from doing something more meaningful. Perhaps I can now let the raindrops, which have started to fall into the pond, just be raindrops. Thank you. <laughs>